my son and I had set a huge goal to become the first father and son to ever finish the Baja 1000 Ironman, the longest non-stop cross-country race in the world, each of us solo on a motorcycle. To that point, less than 10 riders had ever finished the race. This wouldn't be easy. Good job, man. Awesome. You just soloed the Baja 1000 and you made it to the finish line. That is a huge feat. Yeah, it's indescribable, the feeling. When he came to 590, he looked really fatigued. I kind of knew I was going to be over, but I didn't want to call it till he said it. When I heard that he was going to throw in the towel, I was disappointed, but I understood. I kind of was relieved because we were so worried about him. I can't hold my head up anymore. That kink on his neck just never went away. He rode for 400 miles with that neck pain. It's pretty awesome that he actually got to 600. When you think about somebody who's definitely injured in a way that would have stopped anybody, and he decided that he's gonna keep going, you could see the pain and you could see the ravaging of his body from what was happening and from the extent of the injury getting worse. What an amazing man to, to keep driving and digging deep. It's a huge accomplishment. It's, it's one of those things that you don't know until you ride that bar where the, the edge is and uh, he got to the edge and he was smart enough to stop. He wasn't gonna hurt himself or potentially die. I think he found his limitations and he might be crazy enough to try it again. So after the race, I went and got x-rays and I had severe whiplash and I had four vertebrae off to the right and torn ligaments and so forth, tissue around them. My head had gone forward so much, and um, it took a lot of work, and my neck hurt for a whole year. So in 2016, after finishing the Baja 1000, I decided I will never do this again. Such a painful, traumatic experience. I'm not really sure what the future of desert racing is for me. <laughs> <laughs> they all say that, especially the Ironman. But sure enough, over time, you tend to forget the pain and only remember the positive aspects. And here we are. We are both gonna finish this thing, father and son. He did his part and I didn't. If he's going back, I'm going back. This year's course would be different than the last two years, which started and ended in Ensenada, Baja California, Mexico. Those races were 822 and 855 miles respectively. 2017 was gonna be the 50th anniversary of them putting this race on. And for the 50th anniversary, they wanted to make it really tough. So they made it 1,134 miles. And this was a one way, instead of a loop race from Ensenada back to Ensenada, it was one way to La Paz. It's 1,134 miles and last year I went 600. It's almost double what I did last year. I'm not quitting now. I will finish this race. Ensenada erupts in race mania on race week. It's the only place in the world you can see 800 horsepower trophy trucks, which are nowhere near street legal, trolling city streets like they own the place. It was 30 hours before the race was supposed to start. 
and we're in this little restaurant and we're eating lunch and Tanner orders fajitas. He put a little hot sauce on his fajitas and as soon as he swallowed it, he knew something was wrong. You see, he is highly allergic to peanuts. He asked the waiter, what's in this hot sauce? And the waiter said, oh, peanuts. That's the first thing that he said. Tanner stood up and he said, we gotta go. And we went back to the hotel and we called the ambulance right away because Tanner knows he's got one hour till he can't breathe. Off to the hospital, Eli. We don't have a lot of time for Tanner to recover. And I just hope, hope that Tanner's okay. That he worked so hard all year to get ready for this race. So in about three hours, we walked back to the hotel and we got back to the hotel. Tanner sat down and said, we gotta go back. It wasn't right. So we went back to the hospital and the doctor just observed and he didn't give him anything. He said, okay, you know, let's just settle down. Not a good thing to be an anaphylactic shock 30 hours before the longest nonstop race in the world. This is tense enough to be here and worry about the suspense of what's about to happen. We don't have a lot of time for Tanner to recover. We're hoping he will. But on the other hand, when they give you this medicine, it is likely that it could have a lasting effect. It was Wednesday, race day. This year, the race started at one o'clock in the morning. How do you get a night's sleep when you have to get up at 10 p.m.? With a 48-hour race in front of us, I only got a couple hours sleep, and Tanner got none at all. Confidence comes from preparation, and despite the length of the race this year, I felt prepared. This is the hurry up and wait part of Baja. Rush to the starting line, get ready to go, and sit here for a half hour nervously waiting your departure. Just going out to ride my motorcycle. What could be better than that? It's the best place in the world to ride. Beautiful. I'm going for mile 529 by dark. Our second Ironman race, 1,134.4 miles in front of us. There's something inside a man that makes him do something like this, and it's hard to explain. Tanner would start fifth out of 19 Ironmen. That's Tanner Janeski. Him and his hands are going to be so Go, son. If anyone has got this, it is you. on the podium for the start of the longest non-stop cross-country race in the world, the Baja 1000 with my son is still an incredibly special and sacred experience. Last year, Baja beat me, but this was the return of 714X. Tanner was going for a podium finish. I was going for a finish. I would be the oldest starter in Baja 1000 Ironman history. And if I had my way, I'll be the oldest finisher. Four blocks in, you hit the dirt and it's game on. A critical part of the race was already over, starting it. I was rolling. I had 1134.4 miles to go over some of the toughest terrain imaginable and 48 hours to get there. I felt great and my confidence was high.
Tanner pulled into his first chase truck stop in first place, barely. Having fun so far? You're hauling butt, you're doing good. This is a really dangerous part of my 97. The course just immediately shifts to the left. And if you continue going straight at 50 miles an hour like me, smash through three feet of silt and then into like a giant rain ditch. So far, so good. Ride smooth, don't make a mistake, conserve your energy. We're at our first check. We're waiting for Larry to come through, get a quick visual. If he needs anything, we'll make any adjustments like that and get him on his way. At mile 74, I met my van and team for the first time since starting. Both my team and I were encouraged. Okay, so next stop is just uh, 108. We're gonna see you at Valley T. Okay, you good? All right, Larry, go for it. Serve your energy, don't make a mistake, ride smooth, find the flow. Tanner's up there, stay with him. Tanner had taught me that chia dissolved in a water bottle with a little sugar was a great high calorie slow burn drink for the race. It was like chewing frog eggs, but I knew it was good for me. I blew a turn like a little bit and I wound up in a ditch and it was all silt getting out. There was other motorcycle tracks trying to get out. We were pitting and we heard a motorcycle cartwheel into an 18 foot deep ditch right next to us. Yeah, he's down. Better go help him. It was an Ironman rider from Australia. We were sure he was very hurt. Here, let's walk over here off the, off the street. Remarkably, he walked away. Did you lose the phone out of here? No, nah, that's just that stupid bloody GPS thing. Oh, here's one. Here's one. The other one should be close to it, then. We gotta get him. I gotta try the going. All right, Larry, go for it. Come on, Larry. Come on, Larry. Come on, Larry. Come on. Is the guy out okay? Holy shit, dude. And he freaking just drove off the road. He lost two GPSs. Oh, really? The bike wouldn't start. Jeez. 100 miles in, man, are you kidding me? I noticed it was getting markedly colder. We are at a higher elevation now, on a high plateau over the valleys. My body temperature was dropping, and my hands were getting very cold. My fingers began to stiffen and ache. I wondered if I had made a mistake not adding a layer or putting my cold weather riding gloves on. In the Baja 1000, there are many classes of motorcycles. I wasn't concerned about any of them, even my own class. I needed to finish. In motocross, when another rider comes up on you, you race him, not in the Baja 1000 as an Ironman rider. You run your own race, keep your own pace, and don't charge into the dust and make a mistake. Baja pits are essentially gas stations set up every 50 miles along the course. Our race bikes have an 80 mile range with the fuel tank that they have. If you miss a Baja pit, you're gonna run out of gas in the middle of the desert. About 40% of the Baja pits coincided with the same location that I would meet the chase truck. I'd pull into the Baja pit first, pull out, and immediately see the chase truck. Starting at one in the morning wasn't too bad because you get four hours of riding in and then the sun comes up. 
You can see in color, you can see what's around you, and you feel like new life. Being able to see well and getting a perspective on the landscape really helps. Our brains wake up when the sun comes up. A dry lake bed is flat as a pancake and you can open up the throttle 95%, not 100%, and risk blowing the motor. But even a dry lake bed has its hazards. Ruts, sinkholes, and assorted mounds. Things happen very fast at 90 miles an hour. Coming into San Felipe, running in the front of the pack, I was feeling pretty good. When I started the race, I wasn't sure how much the peanuts were going to affect me during the race. I didn't know if the reaction was going to start again and uh, make it difficult or impossible to breathe. I didn't know how my body was gonna react, given that I had eaten them so soon before the race, and my body seemed to be holding up okay so far. first chase truck stop during daylight. The chase team split the duties. Arturo and Andrew took care of the bike, and the other guys took care of me. Yeah, there's a Baja pit right here somewhere. Yeah. Right, Baja pit. You guys know where the Baja pit is? Okay, thank you. Terrain changes can be extreme and abrupt. You've got to be alert at all times. Paved roads are used as transitions from one dirt section to another. To avoid time penalties, you better obey the speed limits. mile 524, over 14 hours into the race, Tanner was doing great at the front of the Ironman pack, but he had slipped to second place. The section was really fast. But the problem is you're just sitting there shaking and everything's hurting. It's like being in a blender. Riding a dirt bike in rough terrain can be extremely physical. At the same time, there's only a small range of motion, like a rowing motion. The same muscles get used over and over again. 
and they don't get a break and not allowed to stretch out. They start cramping up and hurting more and more. As the miles ridden click up, so does the pain. While I was riding, I started to feel a little bit weird. While I was going 75 miles an hour, my eyes started to involuntarily start to shut. It took a lot of effort just to force my eyes open so I didn't crash. Based on this last section, I was getting nervous about the next 500 miles and how that would play out. I was two hours ahead of my race plan. In 30 more miles, I'd be halfway through this race. I tell you, I feel better now than since I started the race. Really? I feel great. This was an important van stop in my planning. I thought if I could get here by one hour past dark, I would be doing good. And the sun was still up. My plan was to finish in 41 hours and the time limit was 48 hours. So I had seven hours cushion for, you know, any little thing to go wrong. I had 83 miles to go to San Ignacio. From pre-running, I knew this was one of the two hardest sections of the entire course, and it would get dark on me on the way. Hey, you have gasolina? Oh, no, uh, two more miles. Two more miles, Baja yeah. Pit? Baja Pit, yeah. Oh, two miles? Yeah, two. Oh, good. Whew, I thought I missed it. Baja Pit? Yeah, two miles. Take a minute. Take a breather. Good. Come on. All right. Good Talk to me, buddy. You're not injured, are you? Okay. We're just trying to look out for you. You know that. Can you take your goggles off? Take a slow. Here, sit up and get in this chair. Sit. Tanner just came in. He is extremely tired, very distraught. He hit the wall. We had to pretty much help him get in the van, take a break. He just has to uh, get a little rest because he didn't get much sleep before we started. So once he gets some rest, we'll see if we can get him across the finish line. Ruts were very deep and filled with powdery silt. Silt is the most challenging terrain in Baja for a motorcycle.
When I went to get up, I was stuck to the ground. I look and I had fallen into a cactus. And I pull up and I've got these plates of cactus stuck to me. I had a side pouch on my belt, luckily on my right side that was facing up. I reached over, unzipped it, and pulled out my wire cutters. One by one, I cut the long needles coming out of the cactus between it and my skin. I freed myself of one plate of the cactus after another. And now I've got these needles sticking out of me, sticking through my jersey. And I didn't know, well, what would happen if I tried to ride like that? Would it really hurt? the 600-mile uh, marker, and uh, Larry's running a little bit behind. Uh, from what we understand, the section he's in right now is the toughest one. Last year, he pushed himself, regardless of how badly he felt, to get to the 600-mile mark, which was the longest ride he's ever made. So if he makes this mark, he's equaled it, and it's only about 530 miles left. God, that was the worst piece of terrain I've ever seen in my life. Everybody was having a really hard time. And I went down in the sill and I landed in a cactus. Oh, oh sh the whole thing, the thing had to be pinned to the ground. Oh, sh you guys can see it. Oh. And where do we need to do it? Here's the really bad news the GPS is out. We're out, out, it's stuck. I had to wait for a guy to come past me because I was at an intersection. I didn't know which way to go. My GPS is out. I'll follow you. You all right? Yeah, yeah, let's go. Are you able to lift your arm or because it's stuck? What do you want to do? Oh, baby, yeah. Oh my gosh, there's a lot of them in there. No, just, just do it. Do you want to give me a Brazilian there? <laughs> Pretty smart bringing tweezers, huh? Ask me how I know I need to do that. Now there's two kinds of needles in me. There's the big ones that are like a needle you would use for sewing that size, and they pulled those out. But there was hundreds of these fine little hairy needles in me. And they tried pulling them out one by one, but you could hardly see them. And so finally someone had the idea, let's shave them off. So that's what we did. We just took a shaver and shaved those needles right off flush with my skin so they didn't rub against my jersey and be really irritating. You gotta get it all out. Um, oh man, it's still fuzzy as hell. Oh yeah! We're all loaded up on the GPS now. Oh nice. I hear it. I wonder who it is. McCachron, what do you think? Oh, where's Tanner? How's Tanner? He's good. We know he came in, we saw him come by, and he went down to his check. How long ago? Hour for you? Yeah. He also said that was the worst thing he's ever run. Yeah. Once they pulled the cactus needles out of me, I decided to take a rest since the trophy trucks were coming through now. All right, I'm gonna lay down. Half an hour, how about that? You got it, we will wait. Every trophy truck that passed me while I was taking a rest would be one I wouldn't have to deal with on course. It was just a therapeutic reset for my body. Let my muscles relax and get up and get back on that bike. Half an hour, that's it. All right, promise. Good 
finish this, I never want to see Baja again. I love you, Art Thoreau, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm leaving you here. All right. I hope my boy is okay. He's still resting. He's still down. Yeah. So I'm gonna pass him. Yeah. Cause he didn't sleep last night. Yeah, he needed a breather. He, he, he maxed himself out. So. Most every time I saw my chase truck so far in this race, I had asked, how's Tanner? Where's Tanner? And they would tell me, oh, he's doing good. He's at mile such and such. He's in second place. He was actually leading the race for 200 miles. Tanner was going for it. He was trying to win the Ironman class. Well, this time they told me, just as I'm ready to go, Tanner is one mile ahead. He's supposed to be 100 miles ahead of me at this point. What's he doing one mile ahead? I knew something was really wrong. You can stop there and talk to him if you like. Where is he? They're gonna be down by the pharmacy on the right. Let's see him. Thanks, Andrew. I took off a little rested and rejuvenated and went down the road to see Tanner. Hey, T. How you doing? Good. Took a nap? No. And I said, Tanner, what's the matter? Are you okay? And he said, I couldn't hold on anymore. He said, I, I felt like I was gonna pass out going 70 miles an hour. And so he's done. And I said, well, are you okay? And he said, yeah. I said, no, no, are you okay with not finishing the race? And he said, yeah, I'm okay, Dad. He said, you go finish. It was on me now. It was up to me to finish this race. All of a sudden, it was more important than ever. I had to make it happen. There was nothing more for me to do here. Tanner was okay. I had to go. A surge of resolve and energy filled me. I was reborn. I felt strong. I would finish this race. My next goal was to go 177 miles to the physical checkpoint at mile 784 by dawn. It was 10.30 p.m. I had all night to get there and still be on my race plan. I had done so much right and I felt good. went about 25 miles and there was the deepest river crossing of the entire course of any course in Baja that I've ever been in. In fact, our guide, when we pre-ran it, fell down in this water because the water was up to the sea and there's boulders underneath there and you can't see where they are. And if you hit one, boom, you're down. Has it been good? Okay, slow, fast. So which yeah. side, in the middle? Yeah. So it goes down? Yeah, yeah. So, I just picked a line and I went for it.
Hey, Andrew, I missed the f***ing Baja pit. I'm out of gas. 646. Let me think now. I, I don't think I got gas in San Ignacio. I don't know how. I don't know if there's a way to give gas to somebody, you know, who's coming this way. I wanted to discuss some options, but the call was dropped. All I could do was wait. I had it written right there on my tape on my fender. The gas pit was at 607. Where I had last seen Tanner was at 606 and a half. The gas pit was right there in San Ignacio where I was fist bumping the crowd. I didn't pull up more than four feet out of the way of race traffic because I wanted to be seen. Maybe someone would stop and help me. Hey, yeah, I'm out of gas, man. I missed the pit. I didn't even see it. Oh, I don't know what to tell you, buddy. I don't know what I can do. No, thanks. Sorry, man. I knew I had seven hours cushion. I was gonna be okay. I mean, how long could it take him to get here? I was only... 37 miles away from where I had last seen the truck. And part of it was paved road, so they could get within 30 miles of me. Baja, go juice. Gas cam to help hold it. Let me put that on and then zip that in between you. Why the heck is this locking up now? Come on, man. Satellite phones are really unreliable. You know, you can't get a full conversation in. They're cutting out, they cut the call off. Oh, yeah. On the sat phone, that means he still ain't going nowhere. Maybe, unless he got fuel from somebody and... Yeah, try, you wanna try or not? Keep trying, man. How far out is he? 30 miles. 30 miles, you say? 46, he's at 646. Ways to ride From with here? It. You can be able to stand up with that? Dude, are you going to have enough fuel to get there and back? This is yeah. cool. Yeah. It's all loaded up. Yeah, that's pretty cool. filled up. Arturo's coming. I'm going to have to really go like crazy. I'm over halfway there. I'm at mile 646. I have about 23 hours to go 450 miles. So I decided, you know, this could actually be a good thing. I am going to lay down in the desert and take a nap. I try to sleep because it's taken three hours for our tour to come, but I'm shivering so bad I, I can't sleep. It's about 40 degrees out here and I'm wet from a river crossing. My socks are wet, and my shirt is wet from sweat, and my gloves are wet. These trophy trucks are whizzing by at 80 miles an hour, coating me with dust. I'm gonna lose over three hours from the race from this. I hope I can finish still. Still waiting for Arturo. I'm freezing, I gotta get moving so I don't freeze to death. It's five in the morning and Arturo's not here yet. He called the van a couple times saying he's having a really difficult time. He's trying desperately to get out here to me but he's carrying a gas jug in between his legs and that's gotta be so hard and the trophy trucks and buggies keep coming through every few minutes and you gotta pull over and get out of their way and then let the dust clear. He had a river crossing to do with a jug between his legs. I may have just screwed up my whole race by missing a pit. I lost six hours so far.
The sun's coming up. And I'm still here. In order for me to finish, if I got gassed by six in the morning in an hour, um, I'd have to do 28 miles an hour average um, with no brakes. And um, I, uh, I've slept 30 minutes in the last, I don't know, day and a half or whatever. Two nights. Um, I don't even know what to say or think. Finally, a four-wheeler that was in the race slowed down and stopped. And he says, hey, you're Larry Janeski. I watched your movie. Your movie is the reason I'm here. Your movie is the reason my wife let me come here and entered this race. And I said, well, that's great. Do you have any extra gas? <laughs> and then his buddy pulls up on another big Arctic Cat four-wheeler. And these guys were just in it to have fun and to finish. And they have these huge gas tanks on there. So I'm like, I'm gonna get some gas. And so I took the hose off my hydration pack that I normally drink out of, and I s siphoned gas out of his ATV. And I got sat phone out and I called and I said, Andrew, Andrew, I got gas from some four wheelers and I'm taking off now. And he said, wait, wait, Arturo should almost be there by now. And I said, oh, now I finally got gas and I gotta wait even more because if Arturo couldn't find me, he had 150 miles to go back to the truck. So I didn't want to put him through all that. He would really get lost out there. So I waited and 20 minutes later, sure enough, Arturo pulls up, topped off with the gas that he brought and I was gone. We join forces now with Larry's team because Tanner's out of the race. So here we are seven hours later trying to get our butts over to Laredo so we can pit Larry and we're gonna get him to the finish line at all costs. What's up? Right here, we need a new wheel. A new rear? Yeah. He needs a hydration pack too, Arturo. It had been 13 hours since I saw my crew. We were so happy to see each other. I was so happy to see that Tanner was okay. I was at mile 784, the farthest I'd ever been on a motorcycle by far. 34 hours into the race. It's good. Well, it's good. I have good. You want to no, it's good. It's still, still pretty clean. Let's save the last two we got. I was completely wasted from being overheated, but after cooling down, getting hydrated, and eating some, I had new energy. So I got, I think, 43 miles to go to the, the Red Oak dump. I asked Tanner if it was mathematically possible for me to finish the race. He said, don't worry about it. You got 43 miles to go. I know it's really close, even, you know, but I, can't, I wouldn't be able to take any breaks. Just do 10 miles, four times. He was right. Take it step by step. 10 miles, that's all I had to do right now. 10 miles. Come, Mr. Larry, be safe. I can't guarantee that. Okay. The bottom 1,000, okay. there's no safe. <laughs> I knew from pre-running that coming up was the worst part of the course. This next 43 miles would be hell. And I got back on that bike and I said, I am gonna finish this race, dang it. And I took off out of there and that is when the course got really hard.
I was really, really fatigued and the heat had drained me. And I caught my pinky on a tree branch and I didn't know if my pinky was ripped off. I didn't know blood was coming through my glove, but I didn't even want to look at it because there was nothing I could do anyway. It was tough and I got to the truck through now the two hardest sections of the course and I was really, really spent. I thought my, my finger was freaking hanging off. It was just happening. Did you, did you catch it on a branch like hanging out? Yeah, a big a branch like this. Yeah, uh, yeah. And it, it grabbed my pinky. Oh, it might be broken. I knew there was a really big hill climb coming up and then an equally steep descent. But after that, it kind of got a little easier for a while. And I thought, well, if I can make it over the hill climb, I can go farther. And I pondered that. And based on how my body felt, I thought it was gonna be really dangerous for me. I had used up all my cushion time. I couldn't finish this race in the 48 hour time limit. And I thought to try would be really dangerous. But I was riding good. I was three hours ahead of my plan. Yeah. And I thought about how I had to finish this race. I just had to finish this race before I die, you know. But I couldn't. I had nothing left. Two years ago, I would have finished Iron. It was 822, but two years ago. Why do I tell you this story? My personal mission statement is an extraordinary life of shared experiences. I'm no different than anyone else. I struggle. I search. If I've discovered anything about myself, and therefore, all human experience. My wish is to share and inspire and empower as many others as possible. Heaven knows I've learned so much from other people, those that have come before me and my contemporaries. If I can be part of the chain of people who pass on the human instruction manual to a fulfilling, high-performance life, I am eager to do my part. If you're enjoying these Into the Dust stories, join over 20,000 others and sign up for my short message of the day at thinkdaily.com. Think Daily messages are about living a successful, fulfilling, high-performance life. It's free, and I pledge to never share your email address with anyone. For business people, you can also get Think Daily for business people, a second message each weekday at thinkdaily.com. And don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell so we can tell you when our next movie comes out. Thank you for watching.